Hello and welcome to the last episode of season five of The Writer's Mindset with me, Christina Adams. And me, Ellie Betts. We're here to create a community of authors who persevere, are their most productive selves and publish at a speed that they are comfortable with. This week, we're discussing rest and how it can make you a happier, more productive writer. So we are recording today's episode in a heat wave. So if you hear any weird noises or wonder why the lighting looks funny or anything else that might be different to usual, it's because we don't want to die of dehydration or heat exhaustion. So we're trying to keep it as cool as possible in here. I'm pretty sure they'll forgive us because everyone will be happier if we stay alive, right? We don't want to die in an episode. I mean, that would probably get us a lot of views on YouTube, (laughs) but no, I don't think our listeners want that. No, I think I'd rather just um, just stay alive and keep making episodes, if that's okay with you. Yeah, I like that one. Shout out to our patrons who help us keep making those episodes. Putting together healthy habits the last few months is a lot of work, especially on top of doing my own books and editing these episodes and doing client work and managing my health issues and seeing how it's helped our patrons so far has really made that all worth it. It's helped our patrons to factor rest into their lives and exercise and healthy eating so that they can get more done. And it's not about these kind of vague ideas. It's about giving you something concrete that you can cling to and use as a starting point. Healthy Habits has made a massive difference to our patrons' lives so far, and you can Get those benefits for as little as £3 a month. And we've got way more episodes to come on things like mindfulness and sleep and how the people around you can make a massive difference to what you actually get done and how you feel in your life. And it's even led some really interesting tips from our patrons. Jeff, for example, mentioned that there's a really cool YouTube series that has yoga and story time in one. So he gets to do yoga and his son gets to listen to a great story. And another one of our patrons, Anne-Marie, mentioned that she can get free cauliflower leaves from the supermarket and then use them in a stir fry or a soup. How cool is that? I love that. I love that our patrons are sharing their tips with us and obviously with the other patrons. It feels like we're all collaborating on building that healthy life together and keeping those healthy habits, right? Right. And that's what we're all about. We're all about supporting each other and raising each other up. So if you would like to join us on that, what's the URL, Ellie? You need to go to patreon.com forward slash writers mindset. Yes. And even though this is the last episode of season five, we will be releasing some stuff over the summer that patrons will still get early access to. That's not all though. If you haven't already, you should definitely check out our awesome podcast merch. Yes, we have lovely merch. For anyone watching on YouTube now, we'll just see me and Christina holding up notebooks and mugs and things. If you would like to check out what merch we have available for the podcast, go to writerscookbook.com forward slash merch. I have about everything in my basket ready to buy now. So um, just got to keep get, keep getting new stuff on every payday. It's fine. <laughs> and I still need to design the nice uh, bandanas for pets as well. Millie's a big fan of bandanas. We're going to do her one that says writer's assistant. So stay tuned for that. Mm, and Frankie will be wearing one. He won't like it, but he will definitely be wearing it. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to hate you. You might have to bribe him. Yeah, that's fine. We can bribe him with treats. He'll do anything for treats. Fair. I don't blame him. So then, as we mentioned, Christina and I are talking today with you about rest and why rest is so important and how you can actually get more shit done if you factor in some resting time. But first and foremost then, because it's not what you think, what is rest? So when most people hear the word rest they think of sleep, right? But actually, sleep is only one way that we rest and it's something we're going to have to do. You know, we're compelled to do it when we feel tired. There are a lot of indicators for when you need sleep. We're all very aware of them. But a lot of us don't think about those indicators for when we need to rest. Heck, we don't even know what we are. We live in a kind of society that's all about go, 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 go. And if you're constantly switched on, you're not going to be paying enough attention to your mind or body to notice when it's telling you to slow the fuck down. Exactly. Rest is sometimes just about breaking that cycle that you've got yourself into. We all do it, whether it's day job or writing or looking after the house or anything. We 
keep pushing ourselves to carry on. It's about allowing your brain to have a break from always doing the same thing so that it can slow down and recharge and allow you to carry on working after that point or not carry on working and have more of a break. Yeah. As soon as you refer to something as work, or chores, even if it's something you enjoy, it adds an extra layer of pressure or stress to it that just means that it's not as enjoyable. Like when I started relying on my books to pay the bills, it was just so fucking overwhelming. And it's part of what led to my breakdown last year because COVID just made book sales too unpredictable. And you put that alongside a bunch of other factors that it's too much to cover in this episode. And I was just knackered. And yes, I kept writing afterlife calls because writing about ghosts really helped me. It Well, it's not just ghosts, it's fantasy. But that was my escape. And it was so detached from reality that I could rest doing it because initially, you know, I wasn't doing it to sell. I waited until I was four books in, which only happened a month ago, to actually start pushing and promoting the series really hard. And because I did that, you know, now the books are doing well and they've taken off in the US. My point is like, yes, I was resting by doing something different. And I think that's the key here in terms of what is rest and what is work. It makes a difference taking that break, though. And like you said, writing about the ghosts and the fantasy elements was a lot more fun. You know, it gave you that break from what was normal before from doing all that work and allowed you a little bit of chance to recharge for your mental health, right? Yeah, and I think I was writing about something so intense at the same time that having something escapist that no one really knew about, except like my really loyal readers and podcast listeners, just helped me to take that break. But it wasn't just doing that that helped me because there were times that I needed a break from that as well, particularly working on The Witch's Sacrifice because that is one of the hardest books I've written just in terms of how complex the plot was and how I needed to tie everything together you know absolutely and it came out well so thank you why is it so important for our physical and mental health to take rest rest is how our minds and bodies recover from when we've really pushed ourselves or challenged ourselves and also the thing to remember is that stress comes from two sides, right? There are kind of two sides of stress. If you picture it as like a spectrum, on one end, you have got doing too much. If the people are listening, I'm currently pointing to the wrist support that I'm wearing that doesn't technically fit, but anyway. Whereas on the other side, you've got doing things so repetitive and mundane that you get bored shitless. And that lack of stimulation also leads to you feeling like shit and getting stressed and burnt out and you have to find that middle ground in the same way you have to find that middle ground with how much exercise you do what healthy foods you eat you know you can have too many vitamins in your system and it can lead to health problems in the same way that you can challenge yourself too much and lead to burnout or you can not have enough of that challenging stimulation and still get burnt out And when we're talking about rest, it doesn't have to be meditation, although meditation can be a very good way to reprogram your brain and slow it down, says the person who's fallen out of a habit of doing it, but does recommend it because it does make a difference when you're in that habit. Just living in contradiction. (laughs) I will get back into it. I will because I'm a very big fan of the meditation app that I use at the moment, which is Balance. Yeah, if we spend all our time just working with no break, your brain will at some point force you to take that break. And that that forced break is never going to come at a convenient time, whether that be, you know, illness or like you say, burnout or anything in between. Your brain will decide it's time. But if you make time for it, you know, schedule in time for rest in between, it's not going to force the rest for you. But if your brain is constantly on, it doesn't have any time to look after itself. And it needs that time to look after itself, both for your Phys- your mental health, sorry, and your physical health, you know, rest is important for both of those. Why are people not getting enough rest then? Our world and the fact that we're constantly connected has led to this always on lifestyle that makes it really hard to switch off. You know, we get a notification on our phone, we're compelled to reach to it. And even just having our phone in the same room as us makes us want to check it more, even if it's not going off, because we're worried we won't might miss something so we are surrounded by these triggers that make us feel like we have to respond right away and then you also think about the fact that you know everything that's going on in the news right now it makes it hard to kind of pull yourself away from it because the world is on fire yeah you can't look away almost sometimes right yeah i know uh, personally my day job 
demands a lot of my time as well obviously during my eight hours or nine hours however long I work but often day jobs demand time outside of work as well I'm quite lucky that mine doesn't but if you work remotely and have the devices there and have teams on your phone perhaps or slack or whatever is used to communicate it's very easy to just think oh I'll just reply to this work message I'll just reply to this work email because that's the kind of societal expectations that we have these days you think oh you know I may as well get that done now I may as well do it and sometimes your job may even expect you to be replying outside of hours And in a way, even if you don't include the day job, there's always something that we think we should be doing. I want to use air quotes there, should be doing, because we've gotten into the habit of not making time to rest. You know, society expects you to be constantly doing something, whether that is work or school or kids or, you know, maybe home improvements. I don't know. There's always something to be doing. You know, people expect you to be using your time to progress in something all the time. And it's just not healthy. People assume that that's what they need to be doing all the time to prove that they're being useful but in actual fact you might be a little bit more useful if you make time to rest as well you see that's what we're trying to say here because rest believe it or not can make you more productive that sounds controversial doesn't it christina It does. But if you think about some of the most successful people in the world, they have things like daily meditation practices. They carve out time to exercise. Yes, some of them don't sleep as much and you've got to find a sleep rhythm that works for you. And that might be four hours. It might be 10 hours. This whole eight hour thing is kind of a bit of a myth. So please don't feel like there's something wrong with you if you don't need eight hours or if you need more than that. There's a lot more to it than that, which we will cover in an episode of Healthy Habits. But Rest is really good because it helps you to concentrate. It slows your brain down. It makes you calmer and it just helps you to think more clearly. And it does that because particularly if it's something like meditation or exercise or getting into a state of flow, which we'll cover in a moment, it it helps the neurons in your brain and it can increase their connectivity. It can create new ones. It can even get rid of some of the bad ones sometimes, depending on how you do it. So it is worth factoring in that time because there are a lot more benefits to it than you might think. Exactly. If you don't factor in that time and allow breaks, your brain becomes fatigued and your brain cannot perform well when it's fatigued, just like your body can't. You know, if you feel physically exhausted, you're not going to be able to run five miles. If your brain feels fatigued, it's not going to be able to process things as well. It's not going to be able to generate ideas. It's not going to be able to work on projects, etc. But If you do take a period of rest and give your body and, well, more, your brain time to recharge, it then has the power to be more productive. It then has the power after that break to actually properly take on challenges and work on things and process things because it's recharged and refueled and ready to go. And rest will boost your creativity, which is what we're all about here because we're mostly writers here, right? (laughs) Exactly. And that quiet time can help you kind of percolate, if you will. So say you're stuck on something. What was that face for? It's like percolate. It's such a good way to describe it. That's how I think about it. I I want to ban the word rumination. I want to ban the concept of rumination. If you ruminate on things, please don't. Please see a counsellor. Because rumination is a sign of depression or languishing. It is deeply, deeply unhealthy. It leads to unproductivity. It leads to feeling shit about yourself. It leads to anxiety. We don't ruminate. We percolate, okay? So I've got an example from when I was working on the sixth Afterlife Cause book, which I'm currently drafting. And I was not feeling it and I couldn't work out why it's like I really like the concept I I love spending time with the characters but something didn't sit right I I I wanted to write but every time I got into it I was like "Eh." and I, I really couldn't work out why and I decided to go back to basics and I started listening to a podcast while I was gardening And it's a podcast called Uncanny, which I highly recommend. It's by BBC Sounds. And it's where people get in contact with the host 
and they share their paranormal experiences. So they've covered poltergeists, they've covered possible demons, they've covered UFOs, and they have believers and non-believers kind of analyze what happened to this person to try and work out what it actually was. And, you know, a lot of them are kind of left open because you can't say for definite what any of this was, but it's still really interesting. And based on that, and then some reading that I did, the concept of what was happening in book six was kind of percolating away in the back of my mind. And I realized what it was missing. So I'd written the kind of opening chapters, but it was the next ones where things from the inciting incident that I was struggling with. And so I went back over my outline based on the things that I'd found out from the research and from things percolating in the back of my mind. And then I could fill in the bits that I didn't think worked, that needed a bit more action, that felt a bit slow, that I just wasn't connecting with. And because of that, I'm now much more excited to write about it. And if I had just forced myself to keep going instead of pulling back and taking time to, you know, garden and listen to podcasts and read weird articles, that never would have happened. And I would have been publishing something that I wasn't happy with and that I wasn't as motivated to work on. That is also, I love that you took the time away from it as well, because yes, you're, you're, series is becoming more popular and you obviously feeling that pressure to keep going because you enjoy it and obviously the readers are enjoying it but just taking that time away obviously made a big difference and now now the next one's going to be even better so I'm very excited (laughs) thank you I I have to say like I enjoyed listening to the podcast and probably would have listened to it anyway but obviously the fact that I could take some of it away and notice patterns and incorporate the patterns that I noticed into my writing made it much more interesting. Like, for example, something that was a regular occurrence in poltergeist hauntings was a smashing mirror. And I noted that happened about three times in about 20 episodes. So that kind of thing is something potentially useful for my writing. Excellent. In terms of ignoring all our advice which would be very silly what would happen if we don't rest then i think you're kind of an expert in this area christina (laughs) what are you saying about my mental health billy (laughs) i'm saying you have gone through some shit and you've learned some lessons and learned a lot about yourself and you felt those effects of not resting is what i'm trying to say okay yeah I'll, i'll let you have that one so when we don't rest it leads to stress And too much stress over a prolonged time is what leads to burnout. And stress can be triggered by work. It can be triggered by family. It can be triggered by friends. It can be triggered by your writing. It can be triggered by anything, okay? So don't just assume that it is your day job that's going to stress you out because it can creep up on you sometimes. And when you're stressed, it can lead to anything from acne to hair loss to brain fog to fibromyalgia, to chronic fatigue syndrome, to migraines, to random joint pain, to, um, I've forgotten the other symptoms, but my point is there is a lot and it affects everything. And also it can be a delayed reaction, the effect stress has on your body because your body channels its energy into keeping going during those periods of stress. Makes sense, right? But then you get to a point where things have calmed down, you know, six months, a year down the line. And that is often when things like the hair loss and the brain fog and the pain kicks in because your body then has that energy or not energy, I suppose. And that's why things fall apart. And so it's trying to get you to slow down. And when you do experience things like fibromyalgia or brain fog, it's your mind's way of A, trying to protect you from history repeating itself, And B, getting you to slow the fuck down. It is a warning. It is saying, hold on, put the brakes on. One of the reasons something like fibromyalgia can get worse over time is because your body and your mind are trying to protect yourself from going into the same habits. So I don't like walking and walking used to be a massive trigger for my fibro. I couldn't do a 15 minute walk to the trap. And sometimes, you know, when it was really bad, I couldn't walk merely five minutes around the block because it was that bad and it would get so bad that my legs would go weak they'd either feel like they were made of jelly or they would feel like they were made of lead so I couldn't walk properly and sometimes I'd have to hold on to my boyfriend or Ellie if I was out with you as like a walking stick and I had to do a lot of work to teach my body that walking is a privilege it is a power you know there's no shame in being in a wheelchair but if your body is stopping you from doing something because it's afraid of it, then the only person who can change that is you. And you change that with kindness and compassion towards yourself. 
and run. That's a good run. It's good to know though. And it, I think those real world examples of stuff that happens to you are like useful for our listeners. I know it's not easy for you to share that necessarily because obviously it's a lot of bad stuff that's happened and that you've gone through, but you've come out the other side and learned those lessons and now sharing them with our listeners is very powerful. Thank you. I mean, I still have bad days, right? Because one of the fun things about my brain is that it worries about things a lot. And I can do all the CBT in the world and it still won't shut up because I need medication and I can't get it yet. So there are still days when I am in a lot of pain. There are days when I push myself too far, she says, pointing to the wrist support again. Or when old injuries like what I did to my knee two years ago flares up. And it is about being aware of that and reminding yourself it's either a sign you're dehydrated when certain parts of your body hurt and old injuries flare up. Or again, it is your body and your mind warning you to slow the fuck down before history repeats itself. And I have noticed that a lot of people who burn out do so more than once. And this is authors I primarily notice it with because most of my friends, funnily enough, are authors. And they push themselves to rapid release or to publish at a speed that is incompatible with the fact that they have a day job or a family. And they go and they go and they go and then they crash. And it takes them six months, a year, two years to recover And then they go again, rather than noticing that warning sign, rather than noticing that the migraines that incapacitate them for a weekend are their body's way of saying, hang on, this is a trigger, you've got to pull back. And so I think being consciously aware of what those triggers are is really important because there are a lot of signs that our bodies give us to rest. And sometimes it's a case of you start to feel a little bit frazzled or scatterbrained. And so that's when you need to take that time. Or maybe you're hungry. Maybe you're thirsty. Maybe you feel fidgety and you need to get up and move. Or maybe you feel lethargic and you need to move or you need a power nap. Maybe you need some caffeine to jolt your brain awake. You know, there are all these subtle signs that we force ourselves to ignore because we have this always on culture and it's really dangerous. It is dangerous because if you think about it, In the long run, if you're always running on empty, if your brain is always running with barely any fuel left in the tank, you're not going to get as much done as if you do allow yourself to refuel and charge up your brain and give it a break from always on the go. But like I said, you've been resting for a while now and we talk about resting a lot. How has resting helped you, Christina? So I will admit I am in a position of privilege in that I have very few responsibilities. It's me, my boyfriend and the dog. Don't go out that much because most of my friends live quite far away and driving I find quite draining. So there is that element of I have more time to get things done and I have more time to rest. But also you know, I could take on more, I could write faster, I could do more client work, I could do more podcast stuff. But I choose not to because I don't want to burn out again. So allowing myself that time to rest and rewatch Ghost Whisperer or take Millie for a walk where I really pay attention to things like um, what I can hear or how my feet feel as they touch the ground can make a huge difference to how calm I feel and how much I can get done. You know, it could even be a case of paying attention to the fabric when folding the laundry or smelling the herbs when planting them in the garden or listening to a podcast with your eyes closed, that kind of thing. It's that quiet time to think and just focus on the one thing I'm doing at a time. And, you know, my boyfriend is the polar opposite to me. He has to be listening to a podcast all the time, even when he's writing code he's listening to a podcast. When he's cooking, he's listening to a podcast. When he's gardening, he's listening to a podcast. And I can't do that because that's overstimulation for me. But everyone is different, you know? Rest doesn't have to be complicated. It's about breaking your routine so you're not just going through the motions and you're doing something you enjoy. You know, if you find something boring or tedious, it's not rest, right? It just becomes a chore or a form of work. It's about focusing in the moment and not worrying about what has happened or what could happen. And that's really hard, particularly if you have anxiety or depression or ADHD or some other mental health conditions. But it is a practice that really takes time to develop. And I know that you can develop it because it's a skill I developed. And writing, if you're not like worrying about rapid release and schedules and pushing yourself really far 
the writing process, sometimes editing as well. I wouldn't go so far as to say formatting and proofreading, but those early stages, even the planning stages can be a form of rest if you get into a state of flow. And I am a very big fan of flow because I end up getting more done when I'm in that state, you know? How would you describe flow to our writers, Ellie? How, why would you say it's good for them? Well, to put it simply, it's about just focusing on the task at hand, the writing that's in front of you. It's kind of like getting your brain into exactly the right gear for that task that you're trying to accomplish. So like sometimes we try and push onwards, like up a really steep hill, metaphorically speaking, in the wrong gear, and you'll still make it to the top but it'll probably cost you a lot, uh, maybe in me- uh, mechanic fees or, you know, in being drained and more, more burned out. But if you're in the right gear and you get all the way to the top in flow, you can make that whole journey almost more effortlessly. Mm. Obviously, it's still going to, you know, you still have to put some effort in. It's not going to magically write itself, but you, you're you in the right gear so you can just cruise on through if your brain is in flow when you're writing you're kind of doing it without having to think about it you know your brain is pumping out the words you're not thinking about what am I writing next what's happening what's all this and again you're not thinking about those million other things that need to be done or I need to go and do this I need to go and walk the dog I need to go and clean the bathroom you're just focusing on the writing um and just letting it flow (laughs) yeah um Well, it is. That's what it is, right? And the key to getting into a state of flow are two ingredients. And it has to be something that is enjoyable and that you're fairly capable of doing, but that also challenges you. And that's why I found it easy to do with Afterlife Calls, because yes, I was writing, but I was writing a whole new genre. So I was having to do it slightly differently to what I was used to doing because it was just that little bit outside of my comfort zone. So you kind of want to picture it a bit. I don't know how this is going to appear on camera. I don't know which way to put my hands um but you want it at a 45 degree angle so you're not going so steep up the hill that you know you've got to levitate to get there or start flying but you're also not just creeping along the floor with people if you're a car with like three people behind you trying to push you because you can't actually move right so to do that to make it the best possible environment, you need to be somewhere quiet that you can concentrate. I find it helpful to have playlists related to what I'm writing. And I've spoken to a few authors and they actually do the same thing. And if that's not your jam, maybe you could go for like a mood station or put together songs that convey a particular mood or ones that really inspire you. I have playlists often for my characters. And I find that if I can pick, I feel I can come up with a song that sums up a character then I've got that character down. So for example, for Neve, it was Gwen Stefani's Let Me Reintroduce Myself because it was her coming back to her scar roots from the 90s. And Neve grew up in the 90s when that kind of music was very popular and when kind of No Doubt and Gwen Stefani was in its heyday. For Eding, I have forgotten the name of the song. It's a McFly song called Teenage... I want to say teenage, it's not teenage kicks, it's teenage something. I can even picture the album cover, but the name of the song has just gone out of my head. I can even hear the song. But yeah, that song about going back to being a teenager and how it feels to be a teenager really helps me kind of switch into her psyche. And then I form the rest of the playlist around her. And also then putting that music on helps to get rid of any other distractions around you. And those distractions like the dog barking in the background can really break your flow when you're trying to explain something (laughs) it's good timing on millie's part i'm kind of impressed (laughs) i'm not sure if it was millie no i think it was next door's dog i think millie's asleep i'm not sure because the back door is open but usually she barks more than just once what about you ellie i'm curious to know how you juggle resting with your day job because obviously it's a bit more complicated when you're working a nine to five or a 12 to nine at yours is yeah, I um I quite like working 12 till 9. Um, obviously, I work from home, so that makes life a bit easier. I can get stuff done in the mornings if I need to, but I, I tend to schedule rest for my days off. So, like, instead of setting an alarm for 8 or 9 o'clock whenever I normally get up um, and getting up and doing things, I will not set an alarm on my day off 
I will get up when I naturally wake up, which tends to be about eight or nine anyway. I don't get up very late, but it's it's the psychology behind it of not having the alarm makes a difference. And then I will spend the morning doing whatever I fancy doing. So instead of getting up and going to the allotment or cleaning the lounge or finish painting the bathroom, which I still haven't done, um, I allow myself that time to do whatever I'm in the mood for. So sometimes that's a bit of PlayStation. Sometimes that's just reading and Frankie snuggles on the sofa. Um, Sometimes... I do get up and I'm in the mood to clean. And so I do clean, you know, or do other chores. But it's the the lack of pressure of having to do stuff. Generally speaking, I tend to put laundry on because hearing the washing machine in the background, I find very peaceful. But that's just me. <laughs> but if I didn't, if I don't set that time to do nothing, I would feel guilty for not doing anything. So it's allowing my time, allowing myself the time to just sit around if I want to sit around, to spend two hours on TikTok if I really want to spend two hours on TikTok. That freedom is what I find very restful. I'm not forcing myself to do something that, yes, I do need to do, but it can wait. And even on those days when I do do that, I often do end up doing a lot more in the afternoon because I feel more rested. I'll do some writing, obviously interview stuff or podcast stuff and bits and pieces, but there's no pressure to do that. I used to spend time at the allotment which sounds like hard work because it is doing a lot of hard labor and digging and this and that but it's very peaceful there um it's obviously very green there generally speaking it's very quiet if I go there during the day when kids are at school and stuff I like to listen to music when I'm there sometimes or my audiobook but occasionally I just listen to the sound of the birds and the wind and just you know too long. I don't I never rush at the allotment I do everything at a snail's pace and just it's, it can be very relaxing even though I'm doing work there because it, it's not it's not work that necessarily requires brain power it's work that's moving this there moving that here dig up those weeds it's just it's tactile stuff generally but it's not brain power stuff so it's still a break from the day job or the writing or uh, the podcast stuff so it's a breaking the cycle as I keep saying <laughs> And also stuff like gardening, particularly if you're digging up like a particularly aggressive weed, it can be quite a good form of exercise. So it's a simple way to factor that into your day as well. It is. I'll tell you what, I do a lot of steps at the allotment and also do a lot of like lifting. I've got muscles now, you know, (laughs) just so you're aware. (laughs) What about if someone is really short on time, though? How can they factor rest in if they feel like they already never stop when they're awake? So rest becomes something else to add to that to do list. Yeah, I totally get that because I've definitely been in that position. I would say start with 10 minutes. I know we say that about a lot of things, but generally speaking, you can find 10 minutes in a day to start with. Even if you have a million responsibilities, which I know a lot of people do, you got a lot of stuff to be doing, people to be taken care of and whatnot. You deserve at least 10 minutes in a day just to yourself. You know, even if that means, you know, 10 minutes away from doing some other chores, 10 minutes is not very long and you can get a lot out of those 10 minutes. Um, Even if it's just sitting down and resting your eyes for 10 minutes, reading your book for 10 minutes, Uh, playing a game on your phone for 10 minutes scrolling through tiktok for 10 minutes Uh, (laughs) i i I want to interject tiktok is stimulation it's not rest true a lot of videos like they happen so fast and the way you how immersive tiktok is like unless you're watching like something really calming like maybe cat videos most of it um is stimulating your brain rather than soothing it Sorry. No, that's true. I mean, the point is take 10 minutes to break the cycle of worrying about all those things, to break the cycle of constantly doing and work and go and go and go to do something for yourself. Like you said before, if you're having to fold laundry, be mindful about it and don't just go quick fold, 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 fold. Take 10 minutes to just, like you say, maybe just appreciate the fabrics or fold this or this sounds silly. I'm going to stop this point now because it sounds really weird. Um, (laughs) No, I think it's a good example. I do because like if you're doing something mindlessly, it's again, not rest. And that's why I say TikTok isn't rest because it spoons feed you, spoon feeds you what you're watching next. But if you're say on YouTube and you're choosing 
to watch a longer video where maybe you learn a new skill. Maybe you learn how to grow tomatoes. That's my thing at the moment. That's a form of rest because you're doing something different and you're actively learning something different, right? And if you're actively learning something that's not psychology, I can't think of anything else on TikTok at the moment. I don't really go on TikTok. Um, I'm, an inst- I'm not even an Instagram person. I don't really like videos outside of YouTube. But Yeah, if you're learning something new that's not making your brain hurt or making you uncomfortable, hence why I said psychology doesn't count, then that is rest, you know, and we all spend time doom scrolling, online shopping, walking the dog, playing with children, aimlessly scrolling through social media. And that time that you spend on social media, not engaging with people, but passively scrolling or reading through the news and going, holy fuck, what is happening with the world or online window shopping, that can be replaced with something much more enjoyable, much more engaging, whether that's playing with your pet or spending time with your child doing something they enjoy. Maybe it's a board game. You know, who talks about board games anymore? Board games are fun. Not the complicated ones or ones that leads people getting really arsy, but like, you know, a simple game of chess, maybe if that's your thing, maybe Monopoly, maybe you like jigsaws. All these things are really good for your brain and they're a good balance between doing something fun and making you think. And I think that's really the key to getting the right level of rest in because we often crave the passivity of being spoon-fed content. And that is why TikTok is taken off. And if TikTok's your jam, have fun with it. But it is spoon-feeding you and that's not going to help you calm down if you're feeling on edge. Doing something you are in control of is what will calm you down. So maybe you pull out of it giving you things in the algorithm and you choose the videos instead rather than just clicking. Instagram trying to copy it for a bit and it drove me apeshit. Facebook's trying to copy it and I hate it. But, you know, social media can be great if you're actively talking to people and if you're using it for networking and advertising your books and stuff. But it's not the same. That It really depends on how you use it and how you view it. And I think if you switch to seeing social media as a business thing, then it becomes a lot more active and it becomes a lot more fun. And sometimes it will mean you then don't want to scroll through it aimlessly all the time because you're already spending time on it doing other things. Your brain treats it differently. Went off on a bit of a segue there, but hopefully you get my point and you don't feel like I'm a dickhead for saying that you shouldn't be on TikTok for two hours a day. No, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, I only do that occasionally when I'm having my rest time because I find it, in, you know, makes me happy. I definitely don't do it every day. It's, it, <laughs> the thing about TikTok and why it works is that it triggers dopamine very easily. Tasty, but there are tasty. other ways to tri- <laughs> there are other ways to trigger dopamine that will have more long term effects like healthy food, like exercise, like meditation. I'm sounding like a broken record here. Why have I turned into this person? <laughs> because it's good for you. <laughs> That's true. I should take my own advice. I haven't been exercising during the heat wave. Like don't, yeah. it, it, uh, just to go off in a segue, if you fall into bad habits or fall back into not doing something, like not exercising, not meditating, not practicing your Spanish, don't beat yourself up over it. Because the first time I broke my meditation record, I was on like 260 days or something. And I broke it on like New Year's Day because it's fucking New Year's Day. Come on. And I was so pissed off at myself. I didn't do it for like four months. And I felt it mentally. I felt the difference between meditating me and not meditating me. I was a lot more scatterbrained. I was a lot more stressed out. And so what I've tried to do is, and this is something you reminded me of the other day, actually, Ellie, is to reduce the barrier to entry. And so, yes, it's too hot to cycle or to box or to do some of the more high intensity exercises that I do. And also my knee fucking hurts. So that also makes standing and cycling quite hard. And the alternative to that is to not even bother doing like a proper lesson I literally put ghost whisperer on and get my yoga mat out and just do whatever I'm in the mood for and whatever feels good. And when it comes to meditating, most meditation apps have a one minute breathing exercise. Apple watches have them built in as well. And like everyone has one minute, right? And there are different breathing techniques that will increase your focus, calm you down, help you sleep. And just taking one minute can make a huge difference. You know, Wim Hof has built his brand on cold therapy and breathing exercises and they work. 
people have studied Wim Hof and found that his mindfulness can fight off, I think it was E. coli that they injected into him. So it was one of those kind of nasty bacteria that can kill you. It might not have been E. coli, but it's of that ilk. And they found that him and his students basically meditated their way out of poisoning or whatever it is that those bacteria do to you. I'm not even joking. I wish I knew where I'd seen that video. I can't remember. It might have been yes theory. So don't underestimate these little things and how they add up and reduce that barrier to entry as low as you need to go. Like sometimes I do think the best way to exercise is just in front of the telly. I remember watching a TV show once and the presenter said that she got in her daily squats while the kettle boiled. That's excellent. Reducing the barrier makes a difference. Like I've been trying to do um, daily stretching kind of videos on YouTube. And what I said to you the other day was I wanted to keep going and do it for the day. But that day, even just learning YouTube felt like hard work. So I didn't. I just went through and did it myself and did the stretches that I fancy doing. There have been days where I like, oh, I can't even be bothered to go and put on the workout gear. I said, you know what? It's 10 minute stretch and I'm wearing comfy clothes. Just do it. You know, and it is normally sat in front of my TV on the floor because that's obviously the best place to do it. I do normally close the curtains. Uh, <laughs> Taking away those barriers, taking away the bit that feels hard that's in between you and doing whatever you need to do makes such a huge difference. It does. And the other thing for me that makes a difference is making it fun. So like you mentioned your workout clothes. If I'm not in the mood to work out, I will either do it in my pajamas or I'll put on my pink leopard print workout gear because it makes me happy. I don't care that my boyfriend thinks it looks obnoxious. It makes me happy. And that can help me to do more. Yeah, exactly. Why not? <laughs> If being obnoxious gets you there to do it, then be obnoxious. Hear, hear. On a slightly related note then, I think it's worth mentioning that reading is very good for those rests. I need to read more. I go through phases of reading, to be honest with you, where some, sometimes I'll be reading constantly and then other times I can't even look at a book, um, which yeah. sounds bad as a, a, as a writer, but you know. I don't think so because pretty much everyone I have spoken to either says, oh, I'm binge reading at the minute or... Oh, I'm reading a bit slower at the minute. Like everyone I know seems to say that. It happens and I think it's normal, but it can feel like work sometimes if you spend a lot of time reading for your day job or as part of studying or as part of writing, of course. Something that Helen Schroyer mentioned in our recent interview, we interviewed her about writing a series, but she mentioned she stopped reading the stuff that she was reading for work and just picked up a fun book to read for the sake of reading for the joy of reading so when we say you know reading can be good and restful it doesn't mean reading something that's going to benefit you that is work that is you know to learn that skill necessarily read something that is just good fun and just enjoy the act of reading that's the difference you know if you are reading all the time for work and stuff breaking that cycle can be still reading but reading something completely different. Yeah, I was reading a lot of psychology books earlier this year and I enjoyed them, but they could get pretty heavy. Like some of them, like The Body Keeps the Score, totally life-changing book, but it makes you, it can make you emotional. It can make you angry. It can make you feel hurt or let down. And taking the time to just read something fun, I think is really important. I did a mood board for my cover designer for the new What Happens in New York cover. And one of the books that I put on that mood board happened to be on offer. And I thought, oh, I'll give it a go. Something different to read because I was kind of a bit fantasied out. And I ended up enjoying the book so much. I bought it in paperback as well because I wanted to read a physical copy. And I wanted a break from reading on a screen, but didn't want to stop reading the book. And I just enjoyed that so much because it was light-hearted and fun and sarcastic while it's also tackling some quite sad and uncomfortable issues and I think something that I used to notice in some genres was that the characters didn't have enough depth for me and that's why I wasn't connecting with them and this book and the one I've moved on to now they do have that depth without being heavy and without necessarily being re- Okay, maybe there are a little bit of research for an upcoming project, but like I'm not working actively on that project at the moment. And I would read and enjoy these books 
anyway. So it's not like I'm picking them apart to see what I can steal. Steal is the wrong word. You know what I mean? I'm just reading them for enjoyment's sake. And I don't feel like I've done that for a long, long time. No, that's good. You're breaking your cycle, you see. Even going from Kindle to paperback is breaking that cycle. It's doing something different so that you can enjoy something and feel more rested doing it. And, and we process um, what we read on a screen to what we read on paper differently as well. Mm. So depending on what you're reading, sometimes that paperback or hardback is better. I go through phases of that as well. Sometimes I really like Kindle. Sometimes I just want to feel feel that dead tree in my hands. <laughs> I, I find that if I'm having a brain fog moment, then a paperback book sometimes helps because I can process the words, but sometimes an e-reader helps because I can make the font size bigger. And so I'm not taking in as much at the time. And I, it makes me laugh sometimes that my eyesight is not that bad. And you frequently comment that I have my font size bigger than you. Yeah, I always have it on like one or two. I like the small words. Oh, Maybe God, that's try. my idea of how I have one on like a six or a seven. Maybe I should on a bad day, I would have it on a seven. My nan used to have it like on the maximum with like half a word on a page because her eyesight was that bad and she wouldn't give up on reading. I make, that's how I good reading is. Text on my phone really small as well, like in the UI. So that everything looks. <laughs> Christina no longer wants to be my friend. <laughs> oh, just please don't make me ever look at anything on your screen, you own. <laughs> like, genuinely, it's not that I can't see the letters or the shapes. My brain finds it harder to process them, which is a neurodivergent thing. And I don't want to overwhelm my brain. No, that makes sense. I, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with making them bigger. It's just it looks really nice and neat when it's small, and that makes my brain happy. I mean, if it makes your brain happy, that's what counts, right? My brain couldn't give a shit if things look neat, if it can't <laughs> process what's on the page. I just want go. to understand what's on the page. We're all different. Find what works for you. <laughs> and, yeah, and like that leads to a good point, actually, in that you have to actively look for that thing that works for you because... Have I mentioned how much I hate exercise? I don't know if I've mentioned it enough this season. Uh, yeah, once or twice. It's come up, definitely. Yeah, but I haven't been around much this season, so I haven't mentioned it enough. Um, but my point is, I dislike it. And I I realise that exercise can help me concentrate. And so I looked for ways to do it that worked for me. And that meant trying boxing. That meant doing Pilates to fix my posture, you know, I have realized that I don't like things like cycling or running because I find them too passive. You can give me a podcast to listen to. I'm still bored shitless. And a lot of people, particularly when you have things like ADHD, you need something that works your mind and body at the same time. And that's why stuff like martial arts, like boxing, like yoga, like Pilates is very good for that because you have to con consciously think about how your body is positioned. And if you're not conscious about that, A, you're probably going to collapse or your punch is going to be terrible, or you might injure yourself because you're not standing right. And also, um, you have to make sure that you are conscious of your posture, because if you're not conscious of your posture, it can mean that you're not doing the moves properly, and therefore they're less effective. And I think actually that might be one of the best forms of rest, just because it is working mind and body at the same time and it will help you sleep better because you've worked in both and one of the downsides to being a writer or having a day job and particularly from working from home whether that's for someone else or being self-employed is that we spend a lot of time sitting in chairs just like these and quite often day jobs don't give you very good quality chairs or we get ourselves a cheap one from certain stores and they don't offer us support in the right place and so then our joints get worse and our minds, because we're not getting enough outside stimuli, feel scatterbrained. And so actually, I think this key is to find, like what I mentioned with flow, it's that balance between doing something challenging and doing something fun. It has to be both and not completely outside of your comfort zone that you're rocking backwards and forwards as a nervous wreck, but you're excited to tackle that challenge. Hmm, excellent. So now I am sure that all of our listeners are convinced that they're going to need rest and they're going to go out and have rest and they know they want to have rest. However, how do we allow ourselves the time to rest? I think scheduling it in is really key. I have heard relationship experts say you should schedule time in with your partner if you feel like you don't have time. And it is exactly the same when it comes to any form of rest, because if you're 
giving yourself that, it gives you something to look forward to. And that can boost your mood sometimes even more than the rest. Like actually it's planning a holiday that boosts us much more than the holiday itself because it's having something to look forward to. And that's particularly good if you're depressed or languishing. And also it then means that you worry less because you can allocate that worry time to after you've rested and or done something fun. Allocating worry time, like say I will worry for 10 minutes at 6 p.m. is a technique that I've heard a lot of people say. And it worked quite well for me, actually, when I've been on holiday in the past. And it was one of the few times I have been absolutely 100% pain free. And I used to think that it was because of the mojitos. It was not the mojitos. It was the mindfulness and the psychological techniques. But also, as you mentioned a minute ago, rest is different for everyone. So some people find socializing restful. Other people need time to recover. Like I often space out socializing, whether that's in person or virtual, because I find it quite draining to be switched on and have to, you know, concentrate on the conversation so that I don't zone out. And there are some people who do back to back podcast interviews to get them out of the way. I couldn't do that because it takes me a while to kind of switch on and then switch off and to feel and to kind of recover. So if I didn't have that recovery time between each recording, I don't think I would feel as calm. And that makes sense. I agree with the scheduling in. As I said, I do that anyway. It definitely makes a difference 100%. But you can also, like we said earlier, find ways to turn little everyday tasks into more mindful things. You know, if you've got to go walk to the shop, appreciate your surroundings, see what you can see, you know, enjoy the sound of the birds like I do at the allotment and things like that. That's going to give you that little bit of respite for your brain to take that little break in between doing things. And again, like we said a minute ago, make sure you find something that works for you. It's no point in, you know, Christina and I are full of good advice on things you can try, but that doesn't mean they're necessarily going to work for you. They may not even work for you first time. It may work for you after that. It's about trying different things and trying things a couple of times, maybe just in case, because, you know, the first time can always be hard if it's something completely new and out of your comfort zone. But try different things and find what makes you feel a bit more rested. Even if you do only have 10 minutes, like we said, try different things in those 10 minutes to see which has a bigger impact, you know, which of those things may makes you feel that bit more rested when you come out of it at the end of those 10 minutes and uh, keep doing it you know like you said sometimes you might fall out of the habit occasionally don't punish yourself for that pick yourself back up and carry on even if you're starting from 10 minutes again keep going and keep carrying on that's going to make the biggest impact in the long run I don't know about you but I feel very inspired and motivated to rest now I want to go meditate I did my uh, my stretching session earlier, which felt very good. And I, something you said a minute ago about thinking about the position of your body, I realized that's something I'm doing during that because um, it's hard sometimes to, I, I have no balance. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, one thing we cover in Healthy Habits is we've got a little bit on posture and I'm probably going to go into more detail about it in another episode because we've had people ask about it. But I became consciously aware of mine and I've had healthcare practitioners comment on mine in the past, but not give me any solutions. And in I think it's the exercise episode of Healthy Habits, which is episode two, three, two. I do mention I found how I found out the actual name for what is wrong with my hips and how to fix it. And just doing those exercises has really improved my posture. And also then that's made it easier for me to walk. And it actually makes me feel more confident. And that's from like five, 10 minutes of exercises a day that I occasionally forget to do, but also they are things you can do while the kettle boils or you let the dog out. So I might try to start doing squats while the coffee mix coffee brew very good for your brain there's a bbc reel about it squats are very good for your brain depends have you ever fallen over doing a squat because my brain did not like that <laughs> i mean they're probably less effective if you've fallen over <laughs> doing what them but i would say if you're falling over you're probably going down too far Calm i've down. almost fallen over but i almost fall over doing all sorts of things it's normal then it's probably not the squat's fault <laughs> If you enjoy the writer's mindset, we'd be super grateful if you could leave us a rating or review on the podcast platform of your choice. Or if you're watching on YouTube, hit like and subscribe. All these things really help other writers to find us so that we can help them to achieve their wildest writing dreams too. 
And don't forget, if you'd like early access to our episodes, bonus content, and to listen to our new bonus series, Healthy Habits, come join us over on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash writers mindset. We've got episodes of Healthy Habits so far on healthy foods that will help you concentrate. How cool is that? We've got stuff on, like I said, how to improve your posture and factor in just a little bit of exercise to make you feel better and concentrate. And we've even got things on the probiotics and how they've really helped us. I'm not a healthcare practitioner, but I am someone who is constantly seeking ways to improve her life because I get fed up with feeling like shit and no one being able to help me. So we are taking an active approach to improving our quality of life. See you next time. Keep writing and we'll see you in September.